Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, looking at the stats, we've got a lot of new listeners from all over the world joining us today. So a big warm welcome to you. If you are a first-time listener or a long-time listener, but if you've never contacted me, remember, techblogwriteroutlook.com, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, at Neil C. Hughes. If you want to continue the conversation of anything that we talk about here, send me a quick direct message, an email, an audio recording, whatever it is. I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. But my big question to you all today is, have you ever pondered how the tapestry of technology, particularly artificial intelligence, weaves into the very fabric of our businesses and daily lives? Well, in today's episode, we're going to sit down with Dr. Nicola Hodgson, Chief Executive of IBM UK and Ireland, and we're going to try and unravel the complex yet fascinating world of AI together. And there's so much talk around AI at the moment, particularly the A word. Yes, I'm talking about adoption. And with IBM's recent release of its annual global AI adoption index, revealing intriguing insights into AI's adoption across large UK enterprises, it feels to me like we're at a pivotal moment. Because despite the UK's ambition to be a leader in AI, Findings actually indicate a lag behind powerhouse nations like India, China and Singapore. But the question I find myself asking is, why is this? And more importantly, how can we bridge this gap? Now, Dr. Hudson, she's going to shed light on achieving all this, along with responsible AI development, closing the UK's tech skills gap and rethinking cybersecurity in the AI age and how we can leverage technology to catapult businesses onto that global stage. Now, before I get today's guest on, a quick shout out to the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily, because in today's remote first world, I think settling for outdated managed file transfer solutions means ultimately you're risking your sensitive data. But if you upgrade to KiteWorks, the gold standard in secure MFT, boasting FedRAMP moderate authorization, KiteWorks isn't just secure, it's a complete transformation of how your business handles file transfers and the communications. And with this state-of-the-art file sharing, email security, and and a platform that's as robust as it is user-friendly, KiteWorks is empowering you to manage and protect your data like never before. So say goodbye to compromise and hello to unmatched security and efficiency. And you can do that by making the switch to KiteWorks.com. Visit KiteWorks.com to begin. That's KiteWorks.com to secure your data and empower your business. But now, let's get today's guest on. Buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to be beaming your ears all the way to London here in the UK, where Nicola Hodgson, Chief Executive of IBM UK and Ireland, is waiting to join us today. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Nicola. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm Dr. Nicola Hodgson. I am Chief Executive of IBM in the UK and Ireland. I am also a Deputy President of uh, an organisation called Tech UK, uh, which is the industry body for tech, and I'm a non-exec uh, director as well. Well, it's a huge pleasure to have you join me on the podcast at the moment. I know a lot of business leaders at the moment are struggling with the concept of AI. Do they dive in? Do they wait on the sidelines until regulations are approved and adoption is the big key for this year. I think last year was all about the hype cycle. This year was all about adoption. And one of the reasons I was excited to invite you on the show today is after reading IBM's latest Global AI Adoption Index, it revealed a stark contrast between AI adoption rates in the UK, where we're talking today, and countries far and wide from India, China and Singapore. So what would you say are the main challenges holding UK businesses back from accelerating AI adoption? Is it that fear of regulation or privacy or, or is it something else? Yeah, it's really interesting when you um, when you look at the outlook from that study. The UK, we saw around 37% of, uh, of enterprise companies, so they're companies with more than 1,000 employees uh, who have actively deployed AI. Uh, and that compares with almost 60% in India, 58% in the UAE, and then somewhere around 53% in Singapore, 50% in China. So uh, def- definite uh, differences there across the world when you look at adoption. Um, but what we also saw in the UK is that around 41% of large enterprises are actively exploring or experimenting with AI. So we will see uh, AI adoption really grow this year. 
as they move from experimentation to um, moving that AI into production. Uh, the, 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 you mentioned sort of what are the barriers. Yeah. We see them as three things in principle. One is around skills and the, the lack of, of skilled people. Second is around costs. And then the third is uh, data complexity. And those challenges need to be addressed proactively and quickly if UK companies want to stay ahead, get ahead, stay ahead of their competition globally. And you highlighted barriers there from skills gap, data complexity and AI deployment, et cetera. So what are the main IBM or what is the IBM approach or solutions to these challenges and, and how can they be applied across multiple industries? Because it's impacting everyone in every industry right now. I'd love to hear more about IBM's approach to this. Yeah, if you take skills as a as an example, I think it's really important that companies are training their workforce now. Uh, some are doing that end to end, by the way, for all employees. Others are taking their tech teams and and really diving in with training. Some are a bit more fl- free flow about it, but we do believe those who will uh, invest in training now will outperform uh, will outperform the others. Um, sometimes it's better to start by working with an experienced partner. Um, they can, you know, they already come with expertise and they can help get you off the ground. Um, and then many of our clients work with AI experts. So we trained uh, over a thousand people uh, in IBM Consulting's Generative AI Center of Excellence. And, you know, they can help clients to develop strategies to uh, upskill employees, et cetera. And then we have a big client engineering team that can work with companies just to build out what are those pilots, the use cases where they can test and try AI, get themselves familiar, and then figure out which ones are going to be most productive for them. Um, and then as talks as well about data complexity, that's obviously a major obstacle. The AI is as good as the data it's working across. And so uh, it's really important that companies build a, a data platform that's organized, secure, unified and governed. And, you know, in the ideal world, well, all companies that we work with are um, hybrid clouds. So, you know, they have that data in multiple places to be able to pull that together um, and connect all parts of the organization. That gives you then uh, all of the data, the fuel you need to run good AI across your business. So, those are the things we are uh, working on with our clients as we help them to both upskill and to make sure they've got their data in good shape to make best use of AI. And over the last 12 months, I've been very fortunate to go to tech conferences all around the world, and they typically begin with a keynote talking about how exciting AI is, the new solutions, how it's going to help people work smarter, not harder, the transformational impact. But then the second half is pretty much always about addressing the increasing concerns around AI ethics. So how do you at IBM approach the development of responsible AI because it is such a huge topic right now and, and also how can businesses ensure that they are AI initiatives are both ethical and effective because as I said huge talking point at the moment isn't it yeah it, you know it's uh, it's a big topic and rightly so uh, you know being responsible is absolutely absolutely critical um you know again looking at the AI adoption um, index we found around Almost 25% of UK respondents said that they've got ethical concerns um, and that that's a barrier to adoption. And so, you know, AI can, we've all seen them, examples of AI producing outputs that are either incorrect or inappropriate, even potentially harmful. So it's really important that businesses have AI that's um, accurate that it's trustworthy and that you can explain uh, how it's arrived at the uh, the decisions it has and so uh, you know we launched last year a platform called Watson X it, it's uh, it's an enterprise platform and it um we built into that data governance I mentioned data earlier but that allows you to then view in a really transparent way where did the data come from? Uh, which pieces of data are being used to help drive the AI decision? How are the outputs arrived at? And then how do they comply with, uh, you know, any kind of ethical policies you might have as an organization internally or external policies and, and any regulations that might exist? You know, if you're a financial services organization, 
uh, then you've obviously got to comply with relevant relevant regulations. So, and that that governance layer, it's called what's next dot governance, but it applies to any of the foundation models that you might might use on what's next. So you might take an IBM model, you might take a Llama two model from Meta, for example. Uh, lots and lots of cases, um, you will use your own company models. Um, or you might take a model from the Hugging Face library. And that's how you operationalize AI governance. And, you know, getting that governance in place early, making sure as a company that you've got as many, uh, as a sort of diverse a range of people involved in your AI decision making as possible, helps you mitigate against bias, helps you put those solid foundations in at the start. And then, you know, we have and many other companies have uh, an ethics committee or an ethics board that can help you think through the scenarios that you might encounter and, you know, what guardrails you want to put around those as a as an organization uh, as you implement AR. And I think it's also important to highlight that, yes, some traditional job roles will begin to disappear, but we've been here before. I mean, going back just 20 years ago, there were no app developers, cloud architects, virtual assistants, social media managers, and even podcasters, you know. So we've been here before, but it's that skills gap in AI and tech in general that is the significant challenge and helping bring everyone along for the ride and retraining, reskilling, et cetera. So how do you envision a future where tech education and workforce training in the UK, what will that look like? And what role do you see IBM playing in, in making tech more inclusive, more accessible and bringing people in from a variety of backgrounds? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. We've, we've been here before. And, yep. um, um, you know, I re- listened a while back to a podcast on Radio 4. They were talking about the advent of the washing machine. Yeah. And it was going to change work forever, housework, women's work, et cetera. I think, I think um, many jobs will change. You said it, there'll be new roles that we haven't even thought about yet. And so it's really, really important that we all stay sharp and, and build our skills. Um, and there's a, there's a big skills gap in the UK. Uh, you know, as I look at that from a Tech UK perspective, uh, last year around 2 million jobs went unfilled. Uh, you know, so we really do need to work on the on the skills challenge. IBM's got a program. The tech sector makes a big, uh, you know, makes a big um, contribution in this space. IBM has a program called Skills Build, as an example, and, and we're looking to skill 30 million people globally by 2030 uh, in tech skills. An example within that is um, an AI found uh, fundamental course. So. Anyone could log into the portal to take that course and start to think about how they might apply AI. As part of Skills Build, we committed by 2026 to train 2 million people in AI. Uh, so that gives them new skills to go and, and find different work opportunities. And we partner with many schools, uh, higher education, colleges, universities, etc., to implement that program. Uh, and then we partner with people like the National Cyber Security Centre. Uh, they have a Cyber First program, and we work with them as a component of Skills Build to uh, help educate girls. It's it's focused on girls in Ma- in Manchester, as an example. And we're working with more than a thousand schools um, on that. I I would say um, as well, Neil. You know, a big benefit of uh, Gen AI is that it makes tech tools easier for everyone to access and so you know now anyone can uh check in on the internet and and use ai tools firsthand and see what they're like coding is now in natural language in in plain english so you don't need to um know a detailed coding language to use ai you know there's lots now of no code and low code software uh and then and then you can see, we can all see on um, customer service applications, the way I, AI can work alongside us to support us to uh, to be more productive and work in a, in a completely different way. Um, I give you a couple of examples in my own, own world. Uh, our consulting team um, launched IBM Consulting Advantage recently, 
And it, it gives the consultants access to uh, AI assistance for specific tasks. Uh, it's powered by Watson X, as I mentioned earlier. But I, I give an example. Um, if you're a consultant and you're working with a company, you might want to take uh, a look at the sort of users of the service that you're building uh, and they're called personas, and uh, that tool allows you to build personas in minutes, which used to take days to do research and and put those those personas together. So that's an example in the consulting business. Uh, we use uh, AI and Gen AI in our own um, HR service. It's called Ask HR. Uh, you can get as an employee a full range of HR and employee services. Uh, you know, with super simple, plain English prompts. Powered by what's next, result comes back immediately. So, uh, you know, the number of percentage of first time resolved queries is super, super high. The satisfaction super high. So, just a couple of examples there of um, how tech's more accessible and making life easier for us. Absolutely love that. And for any business leaders that could be listening anywhere in the world, particularly the UK, because that's where the conversation's taking us today. But in terms of technology strategies, any insights on how UK businesses or any business can leverage AI and other technologies to help close that productivity gap and ultimately compete on that global uh, global stage? You know, I mentioned uh, hybrid cloud earlier and yeah. having that as an intentional strategy so that you can make your data properly accessible from wherever it sits is is a top priority. The other two, uh, you know, we're all on the subject of AI here, so AI and automation big, big potential to drive productivity there. So, um, and just to, to use AI to enhance the, the human, um, the human workforce. So I think, um, what we're seeing is typically AI use cases fall into three, three big buckets. If you like, one is around customer services. Uh, the second is around digital labor or automating HR. Um, and then the third is around application and code modernization um, and those are the three where we're seeing lots and lots of traction at the moment so uh so, so uk businesses i would definitely look in those spaces also in the back office at simple use cases but most importantly i think it's important to get um a clear sign a clear strategy around where's ai going to really help you move the commercial needle of your business and then what are the small number of use cases that you can experiment with pilot and then deploy and get yourself some confidence that they will um will give you that commercial advantage and for any leaders listening wanting to see beyond the hype and uh, more looking at what real world problems can we solve what business value can it generate uh, etc and uh, and also the ROI of any tech project, just to bring to life everything that we're talking about here. Do you have any examples of how early adopters of AI have actually transformed their operations and any lessons they may have learned along that journey that people listening might be able to learn from those early movers? Yeah, look, here's a, here's a really interesting stat. 60% of the early adopters who have gotten over some of those barriers we talked about to deploy AI, they're now making further investments. So you know, they're clearly already uh, see, seeing benefits. Um, there's sorts of use cases. I, I mentioned some of them, but um, I think in day-to-day -day life, you will have come across them if you bank with NatWest. Uh, you've probably seen uh, and you probably interacted with Cora, the digital assistant. Uh, we announced late last year that uh, Gen AI is now being infused into that digital assistant. So that's a, a real-life example uh, we do some work with NASA uh, as an example. Uh, they have um, geospatial models monitoring climate change globally, and lots of companies are now using those models uh, as, as their climate change models. In your world, Neil, uh, it, there's a company in Norway called Etromso, uh, and it's a media company. They're helping journalists speed up research um, and uh, you know, making their jobs more more productive and easier. So they're just a few simple use cases um, where you can see AI having immediate benefit for us as consumers or for uh, businesses to um, get more quickly to where they want to be. 
Sounds like I've got some homework to do. Anything that makes my life easier is all good by me. <laughs> exactly. And if I was asking you to look into your virtual crystal ball at the moment, looking ahead, I know it's an impossible question to ask at the moment with the speed of technological change, but how do you potentially see AI and automation shaping the future of work here in the UK and anything that businesses should be doing now to maybe prepare for those changes ahead? Yeah, I think we'll see lots more assistants working alongside us. I think particularly customer services applications, you know, a good place to look for early competitive advantage and early application of AI. There is uh, lots that can be done around IT automation. Again, relatively straightforward. I mentioned code assistants. You know, you can convert with code assistants, COBOL to Java. You can get full visibility of your IT estate. You, know, you can optimize the assets in your IT estate so that you can avoid your cloud costs escalating, for example, or you can make sure you understand the carbon footprint of your IT estate and you can manage that manage that down. Um, there is AI infused now in lots and lots of software. So, you know, we have sustainability software. Just to give an example, it allows you to... Uh, most companies have got... Um, a sustainability strategy and a plan, and they're in the process of converting that high-level ambition into action. To do that, it's a, a data challenge again. You know, you've got to be able to track your data. You've got to be able to track your emissions over size over time and how you optimize them. Again, AI can uh, can help you with that. Security is another space where AI is big. Again, it's infused into the software, and so. You know, when you think about the rising uh, demands placed on all companies to be uh, secure, um, that helps you to better detect and deal with uh, threat actors. Um, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, and many listeners will be with uh, Wimbledon, the championships. And that's an example where AI-based security uh, is in play uh, all of the time, helping them to be better and faster and um, you know, as it as it relates to um, security threats, so they're just some examples. I think I would look at back office applications, simple ones, you know, legal documents, procurement documents, etc., where you can get get quick competitive advantage, and uh, and then you can help people to spend their time on the more more creative, higher value work. So there are there are a few examples. I'm going to give you one sort of slightly more out there if you like um, and that's the combination that we uh, we can look forward to when you add AI together with quantum computing and there's already some incredible research going on around uh, drug discovery, vaccine development, uh, new material discovery and things like you know really fast and smart risk and fraud detection models so you know, thinking a bit further out and if companies have an R&D budget, then um, that might be something to explore for the um, for the medium term as well. Exciting times ahead. So much food for thought there. And, and a few moments ago, you were saying that we, we're in a situation now where we all need to stay sharp. And I think there is this pressure on everyone to be in a state of continuous learning. So the question I've got to ask, Nicola, is, is where or how do you continue to <laughs> self-educate? What, what's your secret? Wow. I mean, I think you've just got to dabble in all sorts of things and find the learning modality that works, haven't you? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I read a lot. I've always got a handful of books on the go. Uh, I, I read the FT every day. I, um, I'm very blessed in a sense. I'm in a business where there are lots of tech experts around. So I take a lot in by having conversations. I might ask someone to just whiteboard something and I don't quite understand it. So, you know, just putting all of that together. And then, of course, there's formal training that you can uh, that you can tap into. But I think it's important to stay curious in life. And, you know, at the moment, um, tech's moving very fast. So there are many, many ways to stay tuned. And uh, I tap into all of them, depending whether I happen to be driving a car or sitting on a plane or uh, wandering around the office. Fantastic advice. And I would say in nearly 3,000 interviews, the word that I keep hearing again and again, because uh, people are always asking me, well, what are the big secrets of everyone that you interview? And everyone always says, be curious. It is simple as that sometimes. And for, for anyone listening that just wants to find out more information about anything we talked about today, obviously IBM is a huge website. Is there any way you'd like to point everyone listening? 
Well, look, there are a couple of things that might be uh, useful. One is um, IBM has something called the Institute for Business Value, uh, IBV. Uh, if you go to IBM.com, all of their research is, uh, is available. There's a fantastic series on AI. Uh, you know, for chief executives to to look at, and it's about AI applied to marketing and security and some of the things we we touched on. So that's um, that's a really good resource. The other is skills build. You know, you want your people to be uh, trained. It's out there. It's free. Um, if you get stuck, obviously ping me. Um, but but that's that's there to build sort of AI fundamentals. Uh, and deeper tech skills if people need that. So there's lots out there, and um, most of it's available f- for free. And then if anyone wants to explore and get stuck into use cases or talk some more about ethics and uh, what's next, governance, obviously, uh, I'm here. Uh, reach out to me, reach out to any of my colleagues, and, and you know we can help you get started. Well, we've covered so much in a short amount of time today from how we can achieve responsible AI development and innovation without compromising on safety and ethics, how the UK can close that AI skills gap that we keep reading about, make it more inclusive, and how the right technology strategies can actually help businesses close that productivity gap and globally, make them more globally competitive. So much gold there. A huge thank you, though, Nicola, for bringing it all to life with me today. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Wow, I thoroughly enjoyed my discussion with Dr. Nicola Hudson today. And this deep dive that we've been on into the currents beneath the surface of AI adoption and innovation with the UK. But although there was a focus on some of the findings in the UK report, everything we talked about could be related to any country anywhere in the world. And we've explored the spectrum from the ethical dilemmas and the skill shortages to the strategic imperatives that can propel businesses forward. These are universal issues. And IBM's focus on addressing these challenges through initiatives like Skills Build and fostering responsible AI development, for me, this underscores a nuanced journey towards harnessing AI's full potential. And as we reflect on the transformative power of AI and automation, especially in reshaping the future of work, enhancing human capabilities, one question still remains. How will we, as a society, continue to evolve with these technologies? and ensure that they serve as a force for good, inclusivity, accessibility, and progress. Well, this is where I invite you to share your thoughts on this conversation as we navigate this ever-changing landscape together. It's going to need more than myself and Nicola to spread that word and get all angles of this argument covered. So please, wherever you're listening in the world, email me now, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. And if what you've got to say is a lot longer than an email and you'd like a long conversation a seat right next to me here you can come in on the podcast and we'll discuss your views on here too that's what we try and do here every day i uh, implore you to join me again tomorrow we'll do it all again with another guest another in- industry and another uh, technology but more than anything just thanks for joining me today and until next time don't be a stranger <laughs>